For most people, visiting a national park is a relaxing, fun adventure. But for the three people I'm gonna tell you about today, their national park trip became a death trap. And the, pardon my language here, the most fucked up part about these stories is that they all remain unsolved to this day. None of these people have been seen alive in years, and two of them haven't even been seen dead either. From a man who left a disturbing note at the most popular trailhead of the most popular national park in the entire United States and then disappeared, to a high school girl who vanished on a hiking trail despite the fact that she was within eyesight of her classmates at the time. I'm telling you, these stories won't be leaving your mind anytime soon, and so you've been warned. And I'm not just gonna be telling you these stories, by the way, I'm also going to be highlighting the plethora of unanswered questions that surround each of these cases. And so, without further ado, I invite you on a virtual trip to perhaps the most beautiful national park on the entire east coast of the United States. That would be Great Smoky Mountains National Park. Now I'm bringing you on this trip for free, but if you're a repeat viewer of the channel, you must hit that subscribe button to cover your admission. And if this is your first time watching, then welcome. And you can cover your admission by leaving a comment down below, letting me know what you think of these three stories. On March 15th, 2012, a phone call was made to the parents of 24-year-old Derek Luking, and folks, this was not your ordinary phone call. This was the type of phone call that every parent has nightmares about receiving. It was their son's roommate calling them to say that their son Derek had gone missing. Derek had strangely not stopped his alarm clock from going off in the morning for like a long time. And soon after that, he failed to show up at work. Nobody had any idea where Derek was. And so his parents immediately began driving through the night from their home in Virginia down to Louisville, Tennessee, where Derek lived at the time. It had been determined that the last time Derek was seen was on the previous day, that would be March 14th, when he left his home. When his parents finally arrived, they started looking through Derek's computer and they discovered that he had been researching the nearby Great Smoky Mountains National Park and that he had made a hotel reservation just outside of the park for the night of March 16th. That just so happened to be the same date that they were looking through his computer. And so his parents were fresh on his tail, but by the time they reached the hotel, it was unfortunately too late. Derek was spotted on surveillance cameras leaving the hotel in Cherokee, North Carolina around 4 a.m. on March 17th. His parents were able to get access to his hotel room, and when they entered it, they found a Bible and a bottle of liquor left on the floor. After leaving the hotel, Derek's parents began driving west back to Tennessee in order to continue their search. They reached the North Carolina-Tennessee state line at Newfound Gap deep inside Great Smoky Mountains National Park. And there's a little parking lot and like lookout there and the state line crosses right down the middle of it. When Derek's parents pulled into the parking lot right there on the state border, they accidentally spotted a clue that would soon change everything in the search for Derek Liu King. Now, before I go any further, I, I gotta warn you that this story is about to get incredibly frustrating and also very, very disturbing. And it's for that reason that I want to lighten things up for you for just a moment here and tell you about Drink Element. That's right, Drink Element is the sponsor of this video. It would not have been possible without them. And guys, you've probably seen them sponsor a bunch of my videos before. And so if you've been sleeping on Drink Element, now's your chance, you gotta check this stuff out. What it is, is the number one electrolyte drink mix in the game. It's not even close. And I know that's a bold claim, so let me tell you why. They have so many awesome flavors. A couple of my favorites are citrus salt. I love grapefruit salt. They also have these more creative, cool flavors like mango chili, chocolate salt even. Another huge reason why I love Drink Element is because it doesn't have any sugar or any BS in it like you find in so many other electrolyte drink mixes. It's so important to replace your electrolytes when you're doing anything that makes you sweat a lot, like hiking, for instance, or even if you're just working out whatever it is and you're sweating 
sweating, you got to replace them and you got to do it with Drink Element. Go to drinkelement.com slash Kyle Hates Hiking. That's drinklmnt.com slash Kyle Hates Hiking. Go make a purchase of whatever flavor sounds best to you. And when you do that through my link, you're going to get a sample pack of eight flavors thrown in with your order for no extra cost. One more time, drinklmnt.com slash Kyle Hates Hiking. Go get that additional sample pack. I got a link right at the top of the description. And with that said, let's get back into the story of Derek Liu King's disappearance. When Derek's parents pulled into the parking lot at Newfound Gap, they were shocked by what they saw. Sitting there right on the state border between North Carolina and Tennessee was Derek's vehicle, his white Ford Escape. But Derek himself, was unfortunately nowhere to be found. The discovery of Derek's vehicle came at roughly 8.30 a.m. on March 17th, and you'll recall that Derek was spotted on camera leaving the hotel that very same day at 4 a.m. According to my calculations, i.e. my Google Mapsing, Newfound Gap is roughly a 33 minute drive away from the hotel that Derek stayed at. And this means that his parents arrived at his car only about four hours after he would have parked it, which is just astonishing. I'm generalizing here, but in most missing person cases, entire days go by before anyone realizes that the person was missing, let alone knows their last location. But in this case, his parents arrived at his point last known, yeah, only four hours after he had been there. I'm sure that Derek's parents hoped that he had simply gone hiking. It was a trailhead that he was parked at after all, and they hoped that he would return within a few hours. But after they looked inside his car, they became extremely worried and immediately contacted rangers to start a search. Derek had apparently gone out and purchased over a thousand dollars worth of camping, hiking, and survival equipment in the days leading up to his disappearance. And by the way, remember, that's a 2012 $1,000, not a 2024 $1,000. I mean, that's a lot of expensive equipment. And yet, for some unknown reason, Derek didn't take all of it with him when he presumably set out into the wilderness from Newfound Gap. Derek's family wrote, quote, we believe he had at least a backpack, a waterproof watch, a Bear Grill survival tool pack, including a multi-tool, small flashlight, fire starter rod, a Gerber pack axe, several pages of a military survival manual, a knife sharpener, a compass slash thermometer, 100 feet of black parachute cord, a headlamp, pocket knife, iPod touch, and some granola bars. And so clearly he did take a lot of gear with him, but he apparently did not take a tent, a sleeping bag, or his wallet and car keys. And the reason we know that he didn't take those items is because, well, they were found inside the car. The fact that he didn't take those items was a very bizarre sign, but it wasn't anywhere as bizarre as the next thing that they found inside Derek's car. This Next discovery is one of the most puzzling and honestly disturbing twists to this entire story. Derek Liu King left a note inside his car which read, quote, don't look for me. The note was not addressed to anybody specifically, so it was unclear if it was meant for Derek's friends and family, or perhaps if it was meant for park rangers in Great Smoky Mountains National Park, but either way, this was an incredibly eerie sign and more than enough needed to justify a search. In the weeks that followed, park employees, rangers, volunteers, and ridge runners combed the trails surrounding Newfound Gap looking for any additional clues related to Derek's disappearance. Hundreds and hundreds of miles were hiked, much of which was done with tracking dogs, by the way, I mean, helicopters were brought in for multiple days, even once to search at night. Over 3,000 missing person flyers were handed out in the national park, and yet, despite this incredible effort, no sign of Derek Liu King was found, absolutely nothing whatsoever. And if you flash forward 11 years later, this is unfortunately still where Derek's case stands. There haven't been any updates, any signs of him, and it's 
it's really just gone cold. I have a lot of unanswered questions about this case. First of all, I've been to Newfound Gap before. The Appalachian Trail crosses right over it. And so I hiked through it on my AT through hike. And there's also a bunch of other trails that start and intersect Newfound Gap as well. I'm saying this to illustrate that it's a very popular area. There's all that hiking traffic, certainly. And then the road also goes right through Newfound Gap. There's that scenic overlook and parking lot there. And it also sits right on the border of North Carolina and Tennessee. And so all this stuff makes Newfound Gap an extremely popular place. I don't know this for a fact, but I would be willing to bet that Newfound Gap is probably the most popular trailhead in all of Great Smoky Mountains National Park. And on that note, I should also mention that Great Smoky Mountains National Park is the number one most visited national park in the entire United States. Now again, Derek was there early in the morning when he parked. I think it's important to remember that, but I don't know, I just, I, it's weird. Like, how the hell did he show up to the most popular trailhead in the country's most popular national park, walk into the woods, and not be seen or noticed by anybody? Again, I guess it's certainly possible, but it's just bizarre to me. And another question I have is, why did he buy so much expensive gear just to leave a lot of it behind in his car? And perhaps the biggest question of all, is what the hell could have happened to Derek Liu King? There's a few different theories floating around out there about, yeah, what could have happened. The first of which is that he deliberately went off trail into the woods in an ill-fated attempt at solo survival. Derek Liu King was apparently a fan of the TV show Man vs. Wild, which features survival expert Bear Grylls. I'm sure many of us have seen it. Derek's family believed that it was possible that he actually set off into the woods from Newfound Gap, attempting to mimic the TV show, and then he died in the process. This theory would explain why Derek wasn't spotted on any of the hiking trails in the area. I guess he would have taken an off-trail route to do this. It would also explain why he left behind the tent and the sleeping bag in the car. Perhaps he was planning on building his own shelter or something like that, but it still doesn't explain why he bought that stuff in the first place. Perhaps he just changed his mind last minute. Another theory is that Derek Luking set off into the wilderness somewhere and then took his own life. This would be consistent with the bizarre note that he left in his car, as well as apparently some of his behavior leading up to his disappearance. Derek's father was quoted saying, he referring to Derek, started drinking a little bit and smoking cigarettes, which was highly unusual for him. He wasn't happy with his job or where his life was going. But if Derek had planned to just walk off into the woods and then take his own life, then why did he buy all of that survival gear beforehand. It should also be mentioned that theories of foul play are always a possibility in a missing persons case like this. Now, I'm not aware of any evidence that Derek was kidnapped or killed, but until we know what happened to him, we can't really rule this theory out. It's such a bizarre and sad case. I don't know. Leave a comment down below and let me know what you think of all of this. And of course, anyone with information about Derek Liu King's disappearance should call investigative services with the National Park Service at the phone number I have in the description. My heart goes out to Derek and of course his family, and I really hope they get some answers soon. And I hope that by talking about his story, it'll shed some more light on his case and that, yeah, maybe one day his family will know what happened. The family of the victim in our next National Park mystery did eventually get not all, but some answers about their loved one's disappearance, unlike Derek Liu King. But unfortunately, the answers that they got were not very good. In August of 1996, Sheila Kearns needed a fresh start. The 43-year-old had previously been married and had apparently paid her husband's way through medical school. But once she had paid everything off, Sheila's husband apparently just up and left the marriage. It's unclear to me exactly what Sheila Kearns did immediately after her divorce, but by the summer of 1996, I know that she found her way to Mount Rainier National Park in Washington State. It's here that she got a job working at the front desk of the Paradise Inn, 
which sits on the southern slopes of Mount Rainier and is within the boundaries of the national park. Though little is publicly known about Sheila's past, one of her former co-workers recalled Sheila mentioning that she had spent some time in the Peace Corps and also she mentioned the heartbreaking story of her former marriage. This coworker affirmed that Sheila Kearns wanted a fresh start at her life and that's why she took the job in the beautiful national park. And this makes sense to me, I'm sure it does to you as well. What better way to start over than by living and working in the kind of place that a lot of people only get to visit once in a lifetime. On October 1st, 1996, the Paradise Inn closed for the season. The crowds of fair weather tourists had long since passed and though the park was still open, it was now much, much quieter. There would be far less people around to potentially notice anything out of the ordinary. But just because the inn was closing and the crowds were thinning out, that did not mean that all the park employees were just done for the season. There was still work to be done and thus Sheila Kearns, who had recently been hired on for the winter crew by the way, remained in the park. She began the process of moving into a new employee housing building and she also attended some end of the season parties thrown by some of her fellow employees. One of these parties took place on October 4th, 1996. Sheila Kearns went to the party, I'm assuming she had a good time, and then she left and she was never seen alive ever again after this. Two days later, on October 6th, Sheila Kearns failed to show up for work. Now this was highly unusual for her and it really concerned her coworkers, one of whom actually went to her residence hoping that they would find her there. But unfortunately, Sheila wasn't there and her residence revealed no additional clues about where she could have been either. Nothing was out of the ordinary and there was certainly no sign of a struggle. A search was immediately launched in the park, which consisted of dozens of park rangers, many of whom were using search dogs, by the way. Sheila's car was also searched and investigated, which revealed no additional clues, just like her residence had. Her apartment and her car were both completely undisturbed. Investigators initially believed that Sheila, who was an avid hiker apparently, had gotten lost on one of the many remote trails nearby in the park, but after three days of intense searching, investigators ended up scaling back the search and they unfortunately started to change their tune. They now believed that Sheila Kearns had been abducted. After the search was halted, the case basically went cold. I mean, it literally went cold. Winter set in, which complicated the matter even more. But then, as the snow melted the following spring, it revealed a very disturbing sight. On May 10th, 1997, a park volunteer found skeletal remains scattered around a 300 yard area near the Longmire campground, which was within the national park. The location of these remains was roughly one mile away from the Paradise Inn where Sheila had been working. Dental records were used to confirm that the remains did in fact belong to Sheila Kearns. And by this point, it was also made public that her death was likely a result of homicide. Because this occurred inside the national park, the FBI was in charge of bringing the killer to justice or figuring out what had happened. They interviewed multiple people that were possible suspects, but everybody that they interviewed was cleared. The case quickly went cold once again, and it's unfortunately remained unsolved ever since it happened. It's now been about 28 years since Sheila Kearns was presumably killed. So this brings us to the unanswered questions portion of this story. And by the way, if you have a potential answer to any of these questions that I pose in any of these stories, by the way, be sure to leave a comment and let me know what you think. The first unanswered question that I have is how did her remains go undetected for so long? I ask this question because I'm a little bit suspicious of the location where her remains were found. It would have been one thing if they found her like miles into the backcountry. Like that would make sense if it took a while to find her there, but that's not what happened. Her remains were found very close to a well-used 
front country campground and some buildings there. And again, it was only a mile away from where she had been working. I don't know, during the three day search that followed her disappearance before any of the snow and the weather, that's my understanding anyways, it just really perplexes me how they didn't discover her remains. Now, there's not very much information available about this case, unfortunately, so it's definitely possible that I'm just missing something obvious here, but I don't know, unless we learn more, I am really, really puzzled by this. The next unanswered question I have is this. Is it possible that Sheila was not killed by a human, but rather by an animal, like maybe a bear or a cougar? The FBI has never indicated that they even came close to finding a suspect in her murder. So maybe it's possible, yeah, that she wasn't even murdered at all. The fact that her remains were so like scattered and not in one exact place could also potentially suggest that an animal was responsible. But then again, no evidence that this was the case has been found either. And I can't help but think that if there was a wild animal kind of roaming around near the park's buildings, one that was bold enough to attack a human, it seems likely to me that there would have been other sightings or encounters with this animal before or after Sheila was killed. And of course, this is a national park we're talking about, so I'm sure the employees sometimes saw animals, but I feel like there would have been repeated sightings of this same animal. But then again, I, I, I don't have much information about the case, so maybe that did happen and it just wasn't reported for some reason. I really don't know. FBI Special Agent Terry Postma, Postma, I'm not exactly sure, was quoted saying, maybe she, referring to Sheila, was attacked by a mountain lion or, you know, some critter while she was out for a walk. There's also the theory that she was abducted and killed. This special agent also said, quote, just because a person was cleared in an investigation a number of years ago, doesn't mean that new information might come to light, which makes them a subject or suspect again. I don't know guys, leave a comment right now and let me know what you think might've happened. And of course, if you have any information about the unsolved mystery of Sheila Kearns, please contact the FBI. May she rest in peace and my heart goes out to her, her friends, and of course, her family. For our next story, we're gonna go back to Great Smoky Mountains National Park. In fact, we're almost going back to the exact spot that Derek Liu King went missing from, except this time we're gonna be visiting the park over 10 years before Liu King was even born. On Friday, October 8th, 1976, a high school class of over 35 students took a field trip to Great Smoky Mountains National Park. Among them was 16-year-old Teresa Gibson, who went by the nickname Trenny, and also her friend Robert Simpson. Trenny and Robert shared a seat together in the back of the bus for the duration of the drive to the National Park. The class arrived at the Klingman's Dome parking lot, which is the highest point in Great Smoky Mountains National Park and in the state of Tennessee, by the way. They arrived at Klingman's Dome right around noon and they began a hike to the summit of Andrews Bald along the Forney Ridge Trail. Now, if the names Andrews Bald and Forney Ridge Trail sound familiar to you, it might be because I actually covered another case that happened on the exact same trail in a previous video, which was the case of Susan Clements. Now, these two cases are unrelated, but it is bizarre that they both happened on the same section of the same trail. I'll link that video above if you wanna watch that one. The weather on October 8th was rainy and cold, and since the group was starting from the literal highest point in Great Smoky Mountains National Park, I can imagine that it was a pretty unpleasant day to be in the mountains. That didn't stop the high schoolers, however. They were instructed by the only teacher on the trip to hike the 1.8 miles to Andrews Bald and return to the Klingman's Dome parking lot by 3.30 p.m. Trenny and Robert Simpson hiked together all the way until they reached the summit of Andrews Bald. Once they arrived, they stopped and they ate some lunch. And then Trenny, probably cold and wet and uncomfortable, decided that she wanted to begin hiking back to the warmth of the school bus. For whatever reason, Robert decided that he wanted to stay behind and wait on the summit of the Bald for just 
a little bit longer. Trenny encountered a few different groups of students as she hiked back towards the parking lot. The last group that she passed had actually been taking a break on the side of the trail, and they actually invited Trenny to join them on this break, which was an offer that she declined. This resting group of students then watched Trenny stroll just a little bit further down the trail before she suddenly just stopped. This is where things start to get really bizarre in this story. Trenny apparently stopped and then she crouched down, I guess to look at something on the right side of the trail. Then she stepped off of the trail on the right side and out of view of the resting group. This would be the last time that Trenny was ever seen dead or alive. When the resting group of students began hiking again, they walked up to the spot where Trenny had exited the trail and they were very confused at what they saw. They expected some sort of herd path or like small trail to have branched off at that location where she hiked off, but instead there was seemingly no place to go. It was simply just a mess of shrubs, rocks, and mud with no path to follow. One of the students actually called out for Trenny, but got no response back. Another student hiked up to the group from the direction that Trenny would have traveled, and when asked if he had seen Trenny, he said no, he hadn't seen her. Unsure of what to do, the students figured that Trenny had just continued back to the parking lot, and so they left, intending to do the same thing. But when this group of students reached the bus back at Klingman's Dome, Trenny was still nowhere to be found. It didn't take long before the teacher that was overseeing the trip was made aware that Trenny had gone missing, and after this teacher and another student rehiked the trail in order to search for her, which proved unsuccessful, they reported her missing to the National Park Service. The search for Trenny Gibson was on, and no resource was spared trying to find her. The bad weather on the day Trenny went missing made the search difficult right from the start, and things didn't get much better by the time nightfall came. Helicopters were used, large teams of searchers on foot scoured through the woods looking for any sign of the missing girl. Dogs were also utilized. At least six different dog teams were brought in apparently. And at one point, a few of these dogs supposedly succeeded in tracking her scent. Where her potential scent led to though, is yet another wrench thrown into the already perplexing case. These dogs locked into her scent near the top of Klingman's Dome along the Appalachian Trail. They followed the scent past the summit tower and then led searchers part of the way down the Klingman's Dome Road. When they were roughly a mile and a half from Newfound Gap, the dogs suddenly lost the scent, which possibly suggested that Trenny had been picked up by a vehicle at this location. They also apparently found some discarded cigarette butts and beers in that same spot. The search continued for four days, but after this it was scaled back largely due to lack of evidence. Searchers went out again the following spring, but they still found nothing related to Trenny Gibson's disappearance. To this day, she has never resurfaced and her body has never been recovered. And so, what could have possibly happened to her? To be honest, I should probably just do an entire video dedicated to this story because there's a number of different theories floating around about what happened. Leave a comment if you'd be interested in me making that video, but for now, I'll briefly touch upon a few different theories and potential clues. An abduction seems plausible here, especially given that the search dogs lost her scent along the road, but I do wanna point out that they tracked her scent through a very heavily trafficked area. I went up to Klingman's Dome myself, once again on my 2018 Appalachian Trail through hike, and as you can see from this video here, I was also up there on a bad weather day, just like it was on the day that the group was there. And yet, despite that, I can personally attest to the fact that there were still plenty of people around. Nobody reported seeing Trenny Gibson near the Klingman's Dome Tower or on the road 
where the dogs lost her scent. And again, because this area is so popular, I really have no idea how this could have happened. There's a number of other theories out there too, a lot of them foul play theories, the details of which I'll save for that future video, but I do want to note that some people have speculated that Trenny's friend, Robert Simpson, might have had something to do with her disappearance. Apparently Robert was found with Trenny's hair comb after she disappeared, and apparently this raised some alarm bells because Trenny never went anywhere without her comb. However, Robert Simpson was never charged with anything, and I don't know, this just seems like a theory. There's not really any strong evidence. Once again, let me know if you guys want me to make that follow-up video further exploring these potential theories about what happened. And in the meantime, please keep Trenny Gibson, her friends, and her family in your hearts. Since two of the stories I covered today took place in the Smoky Mountains, my search and rescue call out for this video is gonna be Team Busar, which is a nonprofit and all hazard search and rescue team supporting and assisting search and rescue operations in the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. I've made a donation to them and though I'm not affiliated with them at all and they don't know I'm making this video, I'd encourage you to do the same. I've got a link to their website in the description. And with that said, I appreciate all of you watching so much. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button if you're a repeat viewer, and I'll see you in the next video.